We have had a never ending one hour weekly conversation for four and a half years since that moment. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Stelly, what's up, my man? My man. Hey, thanks for coming on. Um, startup chat. I want to start off by acknowledging fact, I think it's 457 episodes. Yeah. Consistency with Heaton. Yes. Dude, that's rare. I mean, and I think somebody said in the podcast game, if you do more than seven, the average is like seven. So the fact that you're at four, I think I'm... Is it for something? It is uh, above 450. I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I think it's 457. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I checked yeah. it out uh, three days ago. You published, and uh, that's really cool. I'm more impressed, I think, with heat, and I've never seen this. St- <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I love you, man. Um, but uh, what have you learned about that journey of just producing content, having those conversations? How has it impacted you, know, you as a founder of Clothes? And congrats on the domain. I've already, you know, I think I sent you an email and I saw that. Yeah. Um, how has it impacted just your thinking. Yeah. Uh, it's been one of the most interesting experiments out of everything that I've ever done in content. So to give you a little bit of background on how we got to doing a podcast together, um, I was thinking about doing a podcast for a couple of months and I don't know, maybe I was a bit like at that time, a bit burned out on, on myself. I was like, I'm doing all these YouTube videos. I'm doing all these blog posts. I'm doing all these talks. E-books? I, e-books back then? E-books, oh, lots geez, of e-books. Right, and I was yeah. like, do I really want to do a podcast on top of all this yeah. that's kind of very much centered around me? And I was like, ah, I'm kind of, no. Like, I, I want to play with podcasting because I find it to be an incredible medium and I'm very interested in it. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to commit to another thing that has me at the center of it. Um, and I have to carry the entire, the entire format. So I was thinking ah, it would be fun to do this with somebody else. And, um, and so I was thinking about it kind of very loosely, like, oh, if I ever meet somebody or find somebody that I think I'd be excited to do this with, uh, I'll, I'll try it. But until then, I don't want to do a podcast. Mm-hmm. And then I met Heaton. Um, I mean, I'd known about him for a long time, but I'd met him once at a, at a, <laughs> we spoke at a panel together at a conference in San Francisco. And I sit next to him. The session is already going on. And it's like everybody's quiet. And I'm trying to make eye contact with him. I'm trying to like be like, yeah. hey, Heaton, we're, you know, we're doing this panel together. And he sits next to me and he's just ignoring me. He's just on his phone. And you know when you look at somebody for such a long time that you think it's impossible this person is not recognizing I'm looking. I'm sitting next to him yeah, looking yeah, at him. Yeah, you feel me. Yeah, you feel me. You, you cannot not see me. Yeah. And he was just not responding to that. And I'm like, oh. He's just that guy. He's just that. He's not as fun and as nice in person as I thought. I'm like, oh, a little bit kind of disappointed by that, bummed out by that. And then we get on the panel and the first- Was he writing you a love letter or something? Huh? No. No? No, 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 not at first. No, no, he was like busy tweeting the Okay, he wasn't. Okay. No, no, no. He And he swears he did not notice me, right? He was like super in the zone. And- the first question that is asked is something around sales. And Heaton's like, I'm going to take this question. You know, uh, I know what Steli would say here because I'm a big fan of Steli's. I read all his blog posts. He knows the most about sales out of anybody on the web. And here's, I read the recent article on this topic and here's what he's going to say. Steli, am I right? I'm like, what? And you didn't even know if he knew you. No, I didn't know you. if he knew me. Wow. I didn't know, like, and Did he, he read gave, your stuff. Yeah. And he gave me, like, massive kind of, yeah. e, you know, credibility. Uh, gave me boot, tons yeah. of credibility yeah. right off the bat and, like, pushing me up basically in front yeah. of the, the room. And afterwards, we chit chatted a little bit, and that was that. I was like, oh, he is nice. You yeah. know, he was particularly nice to he me. Is, and it was I fun. I mean, yeah, he's a, he's a good dude. I mean, he's a great dude. And then two weeks later, we had another conference. And there we had already known from that first encounter that we liked each other and we wanted to hang out. So we ended up two days being inseparable. We just, uh, we, you know, he uh, was supposed to do a website teardown on stage. He's like, I don't want to do it alone, silly. Do it with me. Let's do it together. So he invited me on stage. We did like Q&A sessions together. We basically spent two days together. Yes. Conference, uh, you know, (laughs) buds or lovebirds. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and afterwards, he's like, let's grab coffee. I can't get enough of chatting with you. You're so much fun. And then we had coffee. And at that, that coffee where we had like a one-on-one um, meetup for the first time, I told him, you know what? I really feel like we have great chemistry. We should do a podcast together. And he's like, in typical heat and fashion, he was like, sure, whatever you want. 
sure, whatever you want. And I'm like, all right. Like, wanna- uh, uh, but this was a proposal to do a, like a podcast together or one yeah. episode or? That, well, I didn't really uh, explain yeah. it. In my mind, it was to start a podcast together, not to interview him. Okay. I don't know what he understood in the beginning, right? But because I just said, hey, we should do a podcast, podcast. together. I'd love to do a podcast with you. And he said, sure, whatever you want. And I was like, do you, should we do one today? I have my laptop with me. We can just record one. And he's like, sure, whatever you want. And then I, I thought, all right, so let's think about it. What's the name of it? <laughs> what is the format? What do we want to talk about? And he stops me and says, well, that should be our first episode. Let's just record and try to figure out what it is we do, what it's called, and why we're doing it, right? And that is the very wow. first episode. Is it the first yes, episode? Yes, it's oh, the very so first cool. episode. Um, that first episode was recorded like 40 minutes after we met for coffee and I proposed to be doing a podcast. Dude, that's and a crazy story. <laughs> it is. It is. And if you think about it, this is now, what, I think four and a half years ago or something. Yeah. We have had a never ending one hour weekly conversation for four and a half years since that moment. Um, so it's been, a, it's been amazing. And it's been with lots of highs and lows, right? Yeah. I, I think to summarize the experience and some tidbits for people, um, so one, it's created, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I wanted more heat in my life. I instantly- Totally agree. You know- yeah. um, This is a guy that I love to I, talk you know, with. I, I love to talk to, yeah. exactly. I love the way this person thinks. Yeah. He, he thinks very differently in some ways that yeah. I do, but we're very aligned he's in many one, areas. I've said this to him, many other people. He's one of the few people that I actively seek and am open to the feedback. Like there's mm. very few people mm. that- a, have the permission really to criticize me without being prompted, <laughs> which Heaton has no problem doing, um, but definitely can um, can push thinking, right? Yeah. And so without the podcast, we would have seen each other maybe yeah. twice in those four years, right? We're all yeah. busy. So it, was a, it, it has become this medium that has turned our kind of loose friendship into a very close friendship, like very, very, very close friends. Um, so that that's one personal benefit I've gotten from it. Uh, it has helped me... It has provided this incredible spar sparring partner that's outside my business that really knows me incredibly well, knows my business really well. And when did Close start? We started. We launched Close in January 2013. So that would have been going at the time. Yeah, it was going at the time. Okay. It was maybe the first year, the second year, something along those lines, something between 12 to 18 months or something. And were you producing content prior to that when you were yeah. doing more the agency type stuff? We did, uh, when we did Elastic Sales, which That's was kind Elastic of the sales, outsourced yeah. sales agency, sales yeah. outsourcing, we did content, but it was uh, uh, mostly guest post. Okay. Right. So I would write guest posts for TechCrunch, for Mashable, okay. for all these. There different was still blogs. thought leadership. You might have came across yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then when we launched Close, we really, we really focused on blogging, and I started really do, producing a lot of YouTube videos or creating a lot of YouTube videos. We didn't really produce much. Yeah. Um, and he saw I mean, most that of those stuff. had like fifty bottles of booze. In the background, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember, like, was, I was like, <laughs> that was who is the, this guy? <laughs> just it was like in your condo. <laughs> to be fair, that was the uh, the our office apartment. One of my co-founders, um, it was technical, was really into mixology at the time. Okay, so he was super into bartending, cocktail mix. This was all his. He set it up in the kitchen, okay. and for a while, he would like in the afternoon always experiment with some cocktails and stuff. But everybody was like, all these this drinks, guy, yeah, all yeah, that yeah. alcohol, it's, typical sales dude. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it stood out, but, but, um, so, so it, it helped me, you know, uh, build a very close relationship that hasn't just benefited me in my personal life, but also has helped with the business. Like mm -hmm. he's been a de facto advisor mm -hmm. of ours. Um, just like I at times am advising him, but we, we have both the benefit of having lots and lots of distance. You know, yeah. we don't have equity or shares or any formal relationship with our companies, yeah. but we know each other so well and each other's businesses so well since yeah. we've been there from day one. Yeah. Um, and we always get the behind the scene, like this is what's going on right now yeah. with us, that we've been able to be really helpful to each other. Um, on top of that, I think the the first, the, the medium of podcasting, the thing that I love most about it is that it is the most intimate relationship I have right with ears. any of my audiences. Yeah. So 
people, I mean, you know this much more than I do even, but people come up to me at many, many times at many different areas, especially at conferences and events, but also just in my inbox, um, sending me emails. People say a lot of nice things to me. I've seen it, man. It's right? awesome. And and it's always great, right? Yeah. And I always appreciate that. And people tell me the impact I had on their business or how I helped them with something, and that's always incredible. But nobody responds as strongly um, as the podcast listeners mm. because they have literally some of them have been listening to, to me and Heaton talk for like years now. Yeah. They've developed real habits around the podcast. Like they always listen to it on the drive somewhere, or when they work yeah, out. It's when anchored. They, it's anchored into their lives and yeah. it's so intimate because you listen to somebody's voice. Yeah. Kind of almost You're not as distracted. It's, it's not you hit play on a YouTube video and they'll go to your email. Even if you listen, I find that even if I watch the same content. So it's a YouTube video of somebody speaking versus me just listening to their voice speaking. Yeah. Because it's much closer, much more intimate, because there's no visual stimulation. You're filling in the blanks in your own mind. It's very personal. Yes. It's almost like having that that voice in your own head. Yeah. Right? It's as close as it can be. And so people just respond much stronger. There's a much stronger connection to the podcast audience. And the podcast audience that we have, it's as much smaller audience that we have on our blog. Like with much larger reach of just pure traffic that gets to the our blog. blog. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. We get a ton of traffic on that. Yeah. The podcast doesn't get as much, it doesn't have as wide of a reach, reach. but it's much uh, higher deeper. quality and much deeper. So the type of people that listen to the podcast always surprises me. Mm. Um, just recently, we were looking to hire a director of marketing. And so I was emailing CMOs and VPs of marketing of like really, really big billion dollar SaaS companies. Yeah. All people I'd never talked to before, um, all out of the blue, either cold emailing them or LinkedIn them and just saying, hey, I'm looking to hire person X. I really admire what you've done in your organization. Uh, can I get 20 minutes to jump on a call, pick your brain? Yeah. And I think we had almost a 90% response rate. Um, and they knew your name. They knew my name. And um, I was surprised more than half of them were like, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, that's wicked. Yeah, I'm like, you listen to the podcast? They're like, well, not forever, but I've been listening for you know for yeah. a month and two and I've been recommending it. And it's just like, I really loved everything I heard and I really it stu stuck with me. So the, the quality of the audience is really, really good. Um, but it's been a roller coaster. Consistency is very tough. You so know tough, it. man. I've, so I'm tough, man. Three and a half years every Monday, haven't missed a Monday, won't miss a Monday. I've given myself a 10 year focus. Yeah. It's just, you got to find the time. So you're traveling a lot. It's like shit. When we batch this stuff up, when do we get it done? Yeah. It's, it's hard. And for hard. us, for Eden and I, the first. Because that one hour is when you guys shoot five episodes or? We do uh, one hour a week. Yeah. Um, we usually. Is it, in, is it in person always or? No, it's never okay, in person. It's, okay. It's always through, It's always recorded okay. through Zoom. Yep. now, right? It used to be in person. It was much more fun when I'll it was- I'll tell you, man, you inspired this right here. Because, really? Yeah, because when you told me that, I think it was last year, maybe at this event, you talked about the intimacy of audio. Mm. And I've always ripped my YouTube content and put it as a podcast because people want to consume it, you know, on the okay. go. But then I thought, what, how would that change if I could get, again, you and, you and Heaton's dynamic, all the smart people I know, and, and record high quality, I mean- you yeah, know? you guys. Like, yeah, because you know because I it just the the that that intimacy if it's if it's there, you know. So we'll see the impact. It's you know it's been months, but not years. Um, but yeah, you definitely were a part of this. So that's awesome to hear. Yeah, yeah. I think. The first year, year and a half, it was easy. It was effortless. We were just in love, right? We had so much to talk about. So much about. to talk about, yeah. So much to talk about. It, we would not even need, like, we would jump on the call and then- No prompt, just- Yeah, and he would be like, give me, like, I would give one topic, he would give a topic, I would give a topic. Yeah. Like, we'd go back and forth and we'd just be like, how to create good landing pages. All right, let's go, record. Like, that was it. No prep. No prep whatsoever. Now, that's- Almost still true to today, yeah. but it's changed. The dynamic has changed a lot. So it used to be that we were we had so much to talk about. We're so excited to hear each other speak, yeah. right? Yeah. To hear what we would say. And then I think in year two, it, we got into like a difficult territory where yeah. at times it was really like it was tough on us. Built some outlines. You know, we're like, well, what are we going to talk about yeah. <laughs> this week? And then uh, eventually I kind of took over the responsibility to be like, all right, it doesn't work as as organically anymore, mm -hmm. right? Where 
he just has a bunch of things he wants to talk about and I do. So I'm going to be the one that's responsible to have topics on the docket. If we want yeah. to do something else, we do something else. As you're else. reading some, you can just add something to the list. Yeah. And then we, we would just, we created a spreadsheet and I would just literally like the day before I would just put in three, four, five things because I always follow him on Twitter. I have so many, so many yep. things I talk about. I would just keep it in mind and always like add topics and then we would just pick a couple of them. Sure. And again, we just go. Yeah. And that's still true to today. Yeah. Um, so we don't do prep, but I make sure that we have at least four topics in a spreadsheet to talk about the day, uh, the day off. When did you move to the Valley? I moved to the Valley in 2007, April, 2007. Crazy. So I moved September, 2008. So we were both there for the economic disaster, Yeah. which I don't know for, for me, it was great. Cause then people are a lot more, uh, free. They had the time on their hands and <laughs> uh, weren't so busy, but, uh, how did you kind of break into that network? Right. Cause everybody has to do it. We're not from yeah. there. Yeah. It, it is, it is, a. A bright, it's interesting. It's very, um, there's a lot to connect to, but it's also like there, there's a wall yeah. for people wasting time. Yeah. So you do need to essentially add value in advance. You need to show, like, I love the purity of like, it's about the idea, not what, you know, what, not what you say you're going to do, but like, mm. just show me, you know, don't tell me about your product, like show it to me. Like, yeah. You know, how did you approach that when you moved there? Uh, I had a bit of a tough time. I think my first week was exceptional, mm -hmm. <laughs> but then it was like downhill from there. And it was like, and what did you do in that week? In that week, I think I, I had the right approach. Like I arrived in the Bay area and I was like, I need Where'd friends. Where'd you live prior? Uh, Germany, okay. Stuttgart. Okay. So I sold everything I had. I bought a one way ticket. I didn't have a visa. Mm -hmm. I, my English was terrible. And, um, I didn't know anything about the Bay area. I didn't know anybody. Everything I had done before were like brick and mortar, bootstrap, small businesses. I never yeah. done anything software. I never raised money. I really, I was as clueless as you Naive, can. Yeah. But it was full of piss and vinegar. I was like, what I didn't have in competence, I you know, had in confidence. Yeah. So I was like, I'm gonna you know, take over Silicon Valley. So I arrived and I think- Did you know you want to start a company? Yeah, okay. I, I moved to the Bay Area because I wanted to start a tech company. Okay. And I knew I knew nothing about tech. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, um, and I knew I wanted to leave Europe. I wanted, I was yearning for adventure. I wanted to go either to Asia or to the US. I was like looking for a reason to leave. And then I had yeah. this idea for a tech company. I'm like, I know nothing about technology. Nobody else does Silicon Valley is the epicenter. Fuck it, let's do it. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna make my own movie, selling everything I have, arriving there with a One backpack, way ticket. and then Don't making know, it yeah. all <laughs> all happen. So, yeah, it sounded really cool in my mind. Uh, I was yeah. very excited. Very romantic idea. Very romantic. Very romantic. <laughs> and so. Um, here's, I think here's one, one little story that really, um, I think kind of clarifies w what I did right in the beginning and then how I got like, off that bandwagon. But the very first day I checked into the hotel, I'd never traveled, uh, kind of outside of the, of Europe. I've never been to the US. And so I'm arriving in the Bay Area, I'm checking into the hotel and I'm like, wow, this is it. This is the hotel. And then, then I'm like, well, let me set up my office now in this hotel, right? So I'm, whatever the hell I'm doing, I'm putting in the two books, my laptop, whatever. And then I sit there and go, there's jet lag I heard. So maybe today I'll just chill here. Right? Let me just chill in this hotel room. It seems to be safe. Who knows? Maybe I get Did tired. You didn't know what jet lag was. I didn't like, know yeah, how it yeah, felt. Yeah. How's it going to feel? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When's it going to hit me? I didn't know. Right? Uh, it sounds cute. Uh, yeah. but, but you know, I was like, oh, let me see. And then there was a voice in my head, thankfully, that was like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, you are here now. It's 1 Get p.m. Get the hell out of this room. Like mm. nothing good will happen in this hotel room, right? Go somewhere, meet somebody. You need to get, you need friends, yeah. right? And so I go on online, I go on like meetup.com or something. And I'm like, what are events are happening today in San Francisco yeah. and Bay Area? And I see there's a, a geek dinner or something like yeah. that. Um, and I go, all right, I'll, I'll go like there. There's like legit stuff going every night oh, there. Oh, every night, yeah. every night. So... I go to this geek dinner and I you know, sit down at this table and um, left, <laughs> left next to me is Dave McClure, who didn't want to have anything to do with me or talk to me, understandably. That's interesting. That it was, was on Eventbrite. Was it, was it one of his like finance for founders? No, it wouldn't even been it around was, No, I think it was literally called 
geek dinner, dinner or something. Yeah, yeah. And it was like a group of 40 people, random. Like yeah. I would say there were like five or six and really- he just made it available public to anybody? Yeah. Ba- well, you know. know what? Back then I cold called Dave because his email, his phone number used to be It was not his, his event. I don't even think oh, it, it was his, his event. event. No. Okay, it wasn't the Geeks it on was, the Planet. I don't know who or. was organizing it. Got it. But there was Robert Scoble, there was Dave McClure, and there was maybe one or two other big shots. And then there's a bunch of randoms and like Had me. you been reading like TechCrunch and like knew who Scoble was? I knew who Scoble was. That's so cool, here's the story. Dude. Here's the story. Okay. So I try to, I, I'm literally like, I need to network, right? <laughs> this is my thinking. I'm like, this Dave, Mc, I didn't know who Dave McClure was. Okay. I was like, this guy is showing some demo to some other guy. And I'm trying to lean over and be like, hey, can I also check this out? And Dave is like, no. And he's continuing his conversation. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. And then I talked to some other guy on the right and he was really nice to me. And I'm like, we we're chit chatting. And eventually I'm telling that guy to the right next to me that this is my first day in the US, sold everything I had, bought a one-way ticket, don't know anybody. And he's like, oh my God, it's such a cool story, I love it. And he's like, Robert, Robert, come over here. And so Scoble goes, comes over and he's like, this dude, first day, doesn't know anybody, yada, 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 has a big dream, came to the US. And Robert's like, oh my God, that's incredible. Chit chats with me a little bit and goes, um, all right, what are you doing tomorrow? I'm like, I don't know, I don't have, any plans? He's like, give me a call. I'm like, uh, where, uh, can I get your phone number? And he's like, he got offended the thing for a mini second. There's like, it's on my blog. <laughs> my phone number is on my blog. Just call me. I'm like, oh, okay. Next day I'm calling him and I'm sweating. I'm super nervous. I don't know exactly what, what we're, what his plans are for me. So I'm like, Hey, Mr. Robot Scoble, <laughs> you met me yesterday at this <laughs> dinner. Uh, you told me to call you. This is the call. And he's like, Oh cool. Which hotel are you staying at? I'm like, Hotel California in Palo Alto. He's like, Oh, I know where that is. I'm going to be there in 10 minutes. I'm like, uh, oh, oh, okay. Goodbye, Mr. Scoble. <laughs> and I hang up. I'm like, okay. So he comes, picks me up. We uh, go to this coffee shop. Uh, we buy some coffee, we sit down and he's like, all right, so tell me about you. And I start talking. He's like, no, no, wait, wait, wait. He goes back to his car and he brings out this, this is pre iPhone just to date people's minds, puts together a massive camera setup, mics me up and is like, all right, let's go. And he proceeds to interview me for an hour. That interview still exists. It is the most uh, humbling <laughs> interview I've ever Did we done. get to link up your first talk oh, with Heaton and that yes. below. Dude, the- that, that I, I have a reminder once a year, I watch that recording. It takes me about seven hours to watch it because I have to pause all the time because it's so, so cringy. cringy. It's so bad. I look so dumb in that video. Um, and, but it's a really good reminder. Mm. It's a very good reminder. That's, like, that's not long. I mean, 12 years. I mean, yeah, it's not that long, long ago. You've done a lot. It, it helps me to, because at times, and you know how this is, when you get overwhelmed with requests of your time and help, you know, I do get judgy of people. And sometimes yeah. when people approach me with a pitch that seems, you know, not that thought through, or when they talk to me in a way that doesn't seem like they have their shit together, I judge them, mm-hmm. right? I do judge people. Yeah, well, you gotta, you gotta protect your time. Yeah, but that video remind, like puts things in play, perspective yeah. and makes me go, well, I started somewhere, right? And that yeah. was not that great of a place. Anyway, so he interviews me for an hour, and then at the end of the interview, he goes, all right, what, do, what are your plans for the rest of the day? And I go, dude, I don't have plans for the rest of the year. I don't know. He's like, well, I'm speaking at this event in San Francisco. Do you want to come with me? And I go, yeah. So Robert School was very nice to me on that day. Super. He drives me, before we go to San Francisco, he drives me to the original HP uh, garage, shows it to me. No shit. He gives me a little Silicon Valley tour. He's such a fan of tech though. Like, I mean, incredible. Yeah, such a big so hearted dude. So we go to that event, SF New Tech. He speaks yeah, to miles, other people. Miles? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's cool. There's like three or four speakers. There's, uh, I would say, I don't know, 100 people maybe in the audience. And yeah. at the end of the, the conference, they, have, they had this thing called 30 Second Soapbox where you could get the mic mm-hmm. and say, we're raising money, yada, yada, oh, yeah. we're hiring a developer. Again, a voice in my head is like, this day has been going so well so far to shut the fuck up and don't ruin it, right? Just don't do anything. But then there's this other voice that's like- Get on, get on that soapbox. Get on that soapbox, take the mic, make some more friends. So I take the mic and I go, well, you know, this is my first, second day in America. I don't know anybody. I'm trying to make it happen here. And if you need a Greek friend, come and say hi. The people are losing their mind. I'm getting a standing ovation. And the conference is over. And there's like the three speakers with a group of people around them. Yeah, and, and me and drowning you. in like people. We, we all need Greek friends. Literally, there were people that were waiting, waiting, waiting. Eventually, they were throwing their business card at me and leaving. I had like uh, 60, 70 business cards. And so I'm getting invited to a Dropbox event, to a YC uh, house party, to this, to to all these amazing people. I didn't even know it at the time. And 
like I was joking uh, with a friend back in Germany when I was uh, on, on a phone call with him. I was like, at this rate, I'm going to be best friends with Steve Jobs in three weeks. Didn't happen. Well, I'm, I'm like, I, I, I feel bad for anybody thinking they could easily replicate all this magic. No, no. And I couldn't even sustain it. Like it, mm. the, the first two weeks were like incredible. Yeah. And then I think I snapped into a, like fear creeped up on me. And I was yeah. like, wait a second. It's been two weeks. Like imposter syndrome? No, no, it was not that. It was more of a, it's been two weeks. I'm meeting all these people, but I'm not getting anything done. I still am at a hotel. I need an apartment. I still haven't found my co-founder. Okay. I still haven't done it. Yeah. And so I, I closed off and kind of, uh, yeah. was like, all right, no more focused. meetings, no more people. Yeah, yeah. I need a focus. to focus. Yeah. Um, I proceeded to do a startup for five years that was a soul crushing failure and defeat. It didn't work out. And what and was that one? It was called Super Cool School. Okay. <laughs> That's the name. Um, it was an online education platform. It was kind of like web 2.0 era. Wikipedia is like the, the, the library yep. of the world. YouTube is the you know, TV network of the world. So I was like, I want to build, I want to create a place where people can teach and study from each other for free and kind of create a different paradigm for educational learning. Cool. Like a free you to me. Yes. Okay. But um, so it was very early and I did not know anything about anything, yeah. right? So um, I proceeded to make all the mistakes in the book. I made them all a hundred times. Um, I had a very difficult time. I think I learned very slowly in those years. How many co-founders did you go through? I didn't go through any co-founders. You was, didn't get a co-founder? No, no. Yeah. I hired a bunch of developers, but I was yeah. always very afraid of making somebody... Well, that's not true. It was one person in the very early days that I was like, you could be my co-founder if yeah. we get to some agreement. And then that, 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 that guy who's a good friend of mine today still um, was a bit scared of first startup. He was just from Australia backpacking. And he's like... What, well, there's going to be, if I get equity, there's going to be vesting. So it's going to take like four years for me to own all my equity. And that was kind of the, no, uh, I, I, stopper. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out. So I ended up hiring a bunch of developers and building a team, but nobody was How really a co-founder. How did you fund all this at that point? The co-founder? So no, or the, the developers? The company. Huh? The company. How did I fund it? Well, I did a bunch of uh, businesses back in Europe. I had, okay. I think I arrived in the U.S. with like a hundred thousand euros. Okay. That's still, it doesn't go forever. You know, but I squeezed that money Did real really? good. I squeezed the money real good. So I, uh, I mean, I didn't go out. I didn't buy anything. I, it was eating super frugally. Yeah. Then I, I quickly figured out that housing was unaffordable. So I was like, all right, so, but I do have some money. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll rent this apartment. There's Sub like a two yeah. and I'll sublease. Yeah. And I will sublease to people, um, only people from Europe that Developers. are only here for like... <laughs> <laughs> founders and developers code. that were there for like three, four months. Yeah. And so, and, and I went through a couple of cycles at the beginning. I tried to do it super fairly. And then I was like, wait a second, these people come and go and I have to deal with all the stress. And I was raising the rent for these rooms until my it. rent was like 300 bucks a month. Right. Dude, that's smart. And, um, I mean the developers that I was hiring, I wasn't paying, I was paying them like as little as I could. Yeah. And, and then I did raise some money. Are you, are you ready for this? I raised money. It took me two and a half years and I raised $50,000. Whoa. One check? 12K at a time. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. That was very, very painful. painful. Wow. And, and, um, the other thing that I sometimes forget, I'm, uh, I must be suppressing this emotionally, but I did towards the end. So my hundred K ran out, those 50 K ran out. And then I had a bunch of friends that I had borrowed that I had given money at the time where I had it like years ago. And so I started borrowing money. So I took like 5k USD from, I don't know, maybe five or six people. So mm -hmm. I had another 25, 30 K that I borrowed yeah. personally. Um, that's how, that's how I did dude, it. That's nothing. That's just, dude, yeah. that's such a cool story. And then, and you move on and that was the elastic sales. That was elastic sales. Yes. And then from that close, close, close that IO now yeah. close.com. Yeah. Um, what I saw your, I think you were talking or speaking at intercom recently like doing a, a thing on like seven deadly sins of a demo or something yeah. like that. Yeah. What, like what, what did, how did that come to be? Like, what did they want? I mean, obviously you're known in the space as one of the top thought leaders on sales yeah. and, and software sales. Um, like, do you do that a lot now? Like just, is it, are they a customer of clothes or? They're not a customer. This is a company that we do have built kind of a, and I've built a good relationship with. Yeah. Um, and it just stemmed from the founder's, 
reading some content, liking yeah. it. Then when th their content is amazing, obviously. Yeah. So at some point, I think we'd reached out and we we're like, we want to collaborate on something with you guys. And they were like, we're excited. We like you guys. Let's do it. Cool. So we did a bit of content. Um, some of their sales leadership uh, has been um, super supportive and always been like, I'm reading your stuff. I'm sending it to my team. We're big fans. And so anytime I'm kind of, uh, around or close by, you know, um, the intercom crew, they just invite me to things. Okay, They're so just like, just, come by, yeah. talk. Um, uh, in, you know, the, so so I think it's been just relationship building over and the years. And what were those seven, like, do you remember kind of high level? Yeah, so high level, it is you're giving too many demos. So okay. people, people don't qualify enough prior okay. to yeah. spending, to, to giving the demo. Uh, your demos are way too long. This is probably the biggest heartbreaker for me. And where do you see this? Where should a demo land at? Especially, if, I guess, if they're qualified. If they're qualified, it should be between 15 to 30 minutes, never 60, mm. never ever 60. 60 minutes of demonstrating functionalities and features. The only emotional place your prospect can arrive at the end of that call is overwhelmment. Yeah. Like they can only feel overwhelmed. They can't feel There's clarity no, and confidence. Yeah. So your demos are way too long. Mm -hmm. Um, your, you know, a demo is not a product training, right? It's a sales tool. People confuse it. They think that now is the time for me to turn you into a power user and teach you all the ins and outs of our product. That's Advanced not features. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what it's for. It's mm -hmm. a sales tool. Uh, you try to demonstrate value. You're not trying to make somebody a proficient power user of your tool. They haven't bought even yet. Yeah. Um, uh, focusing too much on features versus on value. Right. And also just doing things that are completely unnecessary. Like I always make fun of people that they click and they click on everything for no reason. Right. So you're on some editing page and you're like, this is the editor of whatever our newsletter yeah. software. And so here, see, this is beautiful. It's simple. It's great. Okay. I get it. I see the page. Right. Fine. Let's move on. No, they have to like type in hello. Uh, yeah, they have to edit know. the form. They and then stuff. they bold something as if I never bolded something in my life. And yeah. then they have to click save. And then we look at the spinity spin will spin. And it's like two seconds, three up. Oh, now it's saved. What are we doing with our lives? Like yeah. this is a total waste of time. Just show me the editor. Go, here's where you're editing. It's super simple. Let's move on. If you want to say this is the beautiful button, you click it and you say you click save. It's safe. You move on. You don't have to yeah, click. You don't it. have to click and wait. You don't have to do it. Um, and then people uh, typically uh, don't highlight for attention. So What's that? that is the, the fact that uh, we think that just because we talk, other people give us their full attention and listen to everything mm -hmm. we say, which they don't. Yeah. So if there is an especially important part in your demo, if there's something that you truly believe they absolutely must see, you highlight it. it. Okay. Say, say, this is the most important part I'll show you. Count down 23, 22, 21, and now show it to me. Because especially if it's not an in-person demo where you yeah. can observe like their body language, the, everything that's going on, if it's a virtual demo, which a lot of them are today, yep. you don't know what they're doing. They might be on their phone. They might be reading emails. They may or may not be completely with you. So you don't want them. It's fine for them to miss some parts, yeah, but you but don't. Yeah, but that's the um, drop the mic moment. Like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then most demos don't have a close or have a miserable close. It's so crazy. Oh my God. What's your, what's your go-to transition for a close? Like how do you, how do you recommend people ask? Like, you know, where do you want to go from here? They say, this sounds this great. It's like, perfect. Let's go into our account, update your card. What, what is your, yeah. So it, it's it, mid market, you know, yeah. SMB. So I would say, um, first of all, you need to know what is the next best step. Mm -hmm. Then you need to ask yourself, can we take, can we make that part of the demo? Mm -hmm. So instead of ending the demo and then sending me an email to take that next best step on my own, can you just take it with me or for me right on there and then? then? Yeah. You already got me. Like, yeah. I'll give you a, a simple example, like maybe converting them instantly to giving you a credit card can or cannot be done. I don't know. Yeah. You should attempt it. But let's say there needs to be a follow-up call. Yeah. It drives Schedule me it. nuts. Bam, Schedule bam. it right there. Yeah. It's Don't hang must. up and send me an email. Just no. do it right and then. And then it's like, I sent it to you. Open up your email. Do you got to add it to your calendar? So we're confirmed. Yes. I like to do the restaurant bit where it's like, hey, all I ask is that if something comes up that you can't make yes. it that day, can you, you know, it's just like all these ridiculous like conversion increases if you do the simple things. Yeah. So your, your prescription is figure out what the next step is in the process. And if you can try to do it at that moment. Yes. But regardless, you want to get a commitment on that call for that next step. Yes. And then like this may, and what if they say, Hey, just, you know, this like, 
I, I want to do this, but this looks good. Send, send me a proposal. Cause that's like everybody's go-to to essentially don't want to talk to you. And salespeople are like, Oh, it's good. Sure. Yeah. So if somebody, like, no matter what somebody tells me, I I'm trying to truly get to the real objection, the, a real understanding of what's going on. I want to fill in as little blanks as possible. And I think the biggest sin that uh, people make in selling in general is that they fill in a ton of blanks themselves. They're like, oh, they said, sell a uh, send me a proposal. I think by next week they'll buy. Wait a second. Nobody, nobody ever said by next week. Nobody said next week. Nobody said you next week. You made that up. You made that up in your mind. Wow, and you add that to your sales you or just, whatever. You, yeah. And you'll go back and if a couple of days are gone, you will believe you heard them say that, right? Nobody ever said that. Nobody even said they're going to buy. They just said, send me a proposal. Everything mm -hmm. else was made up in your own mind. I don't like to make up things. So you tell me, send me a proposal. I'll say, happy to do so. Let me ask you, um, how do you like the proposal to be sent? What does it look like? What do you do once you have it? How yeah. many proposals do you typically request from vendors? And what happens next? I want to be educated. Teach what am I doing? And what am I doing even? Like, what is the purpose of the proposal? If my proposal competes with seven others, it's a very different context than if you, if you need it for procurement or legal. Or like, totally there could be different. so many different use cases of what you're going to do with it. I cannot just send you one thing without knowing its purpose, right? So I can design it to fulfill its purpose, to mm -hmm. succeed in its purpose. And so... I think that um, most people, they just, they're so happy to get any signal that could be interpreted as positive that they take it and run with it. Like, why ruin this? The person said proposal. Yeah. Why ruin this beautiful moment by asking you more questions? Yeah. Well, you want to ruin the beautiful moment because you don't know if it's a moment and it's surely not beautiful because a proposal in and doesn't of itself mean nothing. doesn't mean anything. So get so is that number six on how to ask for the close? That's the last point. That was the last one. That's the last point. And and when you work with sales teams in the past or your own sales team, um, what kind of impact do you see if you can just like get them to do that? These these elements. Well, you find that uh, I mean all numbers go up because if you only give demos to people that are highly qualified, mm -hmm. right? The use of your time is going to go up and your closing rate is going to go up because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're demoing, uh, if you do, uh, you know, 50 out of a hundred demos a week to design students in Australia that are looking at software tools, yeah, they're doing then a research project, it doesn't so, yeah. matter how good you are in selling or how great your tool is. These people cannot buy. Yeah. So why are you spending 50 hours of your week giving or whatever yeah. it is, giving demos to people that could never buy or would, should never buy? buy because it's yeah. not the right fit. Or you take a demo that's going an hour and 15 down to 30. Yes. You're increasing your capacity. You're doubling the amount of demos you can give mm. or you're shortening the Is that even code. true on an enterprise? What would you do? Just chunk it down? You chunk it down. Yeah. You chunk it down. Yeah. Um, again, there's no scenario. I love that. There's nothing that, that's going to end up except for confusion or overwhelm. Yeah. There's nobody can listen to another person demonstrating features and functionalities and a product, Six any minutes. product yeah. for 60 minutes straight and feel light, clear, co confident. clear, confident, and ready to take it's action. The right decision. <laughs> nobody. Yeah, they're gonna go, nobody. Wow, I'm not sure if we're ready for that. They're going to be like, wow, I got a lot of information. Yeah. I appreciate it. I need to take time to digest this. Yeah. Which is not what the goal of your demo is not let's have overwhelm these poor souls so much that they feel like, Whoa, I need weeks to like digest all this. This is not going to get you closer to you, the outcome that you want. And then close is, um, core value prop and it may have expanded but in the origin, original days it was the the calling aspect of it yeah so communication and productivity is still kind of a number one the reason why we win when we compete with uh, other crms yeah we started by innovating in some unique ways that now a lot of companies have I've copied added, yeah. the first thing was that we we're the first one first crm to have um a VoIP out of the box so you can make and receive calls within the system. Okay. Uh, then we were the first ones to do two-way email sync. So you would just put in your email you guys credentials. Were the first ones to do that? First ones to do that. Um, and like to do not that, long ago. Yeah, well, 2013. Wow. Yeah. And it was like historical. So you would put so before in, that, you'd have to grab the emails and put it you in. You would have to forward emails. Okay. Yes. The BCC. That was the best stuff. that they yeah, had, the BCC yeah. or forward. Yeah, and I for us, that. we would just automatically grab it. We could also historically, so you put in a lead and an email and boom, now all the emails that you had back and forth historically were in our system. Mm. Um, 
And we were the first ones to do text messages right out of the box in the CRM. So reducing data entry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and increasing productivity, yeah. right? And we thought we were, I think, the first ones to really think of a CRM as a communication tool, mm -hmm. not as a pure database. Yeah. Interesting. And then the journey of growing that to now, I think, 30 some people all over the world. And are you guys bootstrapped? Yes and no. So we're 40 people, 14 yeah. different countries. 40 um, people now. Wow. Close is self-funded and is like customer funded, yeah. so bootstrapped, yeah. but the company isn't. And so what I mean by that is we went through Y Combinator. Okay. We raised a seed round that was for a completely different idea. Then we spent half of that money for that idea that didn't work out. We pivoted to Elastic Sales. We ran out of that money and Elastic turned a profit and then we launched Close. Got it. Now, most of these investors that invested in us, that was a convertible that round. Um, some of them converted, some of them haven't converted yet. Uh, so we're kind of in this, in this unique spot where we did have some investors and we have some investors on the board, but at the same time, the business was really bootstrapped. And that's how we run it today. Okay. Well, and I always thought it was bootstrapped, but there's something on your website that says like fully bootstrapped or there's this a really interesting really? language. Huh. Yeah. Or, yeah. I don't remember the specific language. <laughs> um, how did you decide to buy the dot com? Cause that's yeah. a, yeah. And have you been public on what it costs or? We've not been public on what it costs, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's but six I mean, figures. it's a one word closed dot yeah, yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. Um, not as expensive as oh, it's it could have been. only six figures. I thought it would have been seven. Now, it, the first time I we tried to buy the domain was f six years ago. Yeah. And at that point, he, the owner quoted us um, a seven figure uh, sure. number. And so he didn't have seven figures at that point. So we're like, well, you know, let's just stay friends and see what happens. So uh, basically uh, once every quarter I would check in on him. Uh, and at first he was doing his own startup using that domain. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. Then he was an investor in a startup that had a similar name. He's like, I'm probably going to give it to those guys. That didn't work out. And then he was just like, you know, I would sell it to you because I don't have a use case for it right now, but only for massive amount of money. And uh, so we kept saying, we want to buy it. We can't afford it for this price, but we'll check in again in three months. Maybe you want to have it, sell it for a different price, yeah. or maybe we can afford it. Yeah. So I made sure that I just kept stayed up to touch, date. Yeah. Yes. And the reason we wanted to buy it from the get-go, um, mainly for two reasons. One was branding. We, we knew that at .io is communicating that we're new, we're startup. That was totally cool in the first year, yeah. the first two years of the company's existence. But as we scaled and grew as a business, as we matured, our customers matured, .io was not necessarily kind of the, the signal we wanted to give. Is like, yeah. this is brand new. We're just getting started. We're in a cool, small team. Yeah because that's not true. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to have the branding impact of a .com and um, you can't really trademark close as a name. Mm. So we knew that a, it, it would be really bad if a competitor bought it, yeah. right? And we had some competitors that had played around with using close in product names yeah. to rank against us uh, in search and all that. So we're like yeah. kind of wary about it, wary of it. And so uh, a year and a half, like last year at some point, we were came very close to buying that domain. Mm -hmm. Very, very close. I mean, it was a final signature that was missing. And I don't know what it was. In the final moment, um, one of my two co-founders and I decided, you know what? It's been so many years we've been talking to the owner and now he's ready to sell and he's ready to sell for a much better price than he originally told us. Maybe we step back and we wait for a little bit long. He hasn't sold it in four years, right? So, and he seems very Motivated. Motivated now. Let's just step back and wait another three, wow, four months. Wow, that's ballsy, man. Yeah. And so we stepped back out of it. And Did you ask him if there was like a life event that went on that, that got him to... No, I don't no? think I asked at that time. No. It's a good question, but I didn't. Yeah. Um, and I think th four months, five months later, he approached us again. <laughs> And this As was the sales guy, you and this know. Is, yeah, you know. and this is the first time that oh he emailed us. I know. Right? You right, might, right, would right. you like? Yeah, oh we're my like, gosh, okay, the feeling. okay, now yeah, doing that now dance. The, the, ta yeah. the tables have turned. <laughs> oh, so right? good. So, and he he basically was like, hey, you know, we were so close to a deal. We'd yeah. love to make a deal happen at the same terms we can make it happen. And then we responded, said, same terms don't work for us anymore. These are new terms. We would be interested in exploring this further. Mm. And so we went back and forth, and uh, and we ended up buying the name, uh, domain name at a much better price than even we had, we would have had bought it six months prior or wow. something. And it's funny, he was a good negotiator at the very tail end. He did like a sneaky thing. This is a good thing to keep in mind. 
And at the very end, we're, like where he sends us the final contract, he added a bunch of stuff in there. Like he added, I think, about another 80K. Between, okay. Between the number we, we, we had agreed on. Yeah. And he added another like four line items that were 80K of yeah. additional cost. And my, one of my co-founders, he lost his shit. He's like, what is all this shit? And so I ping him and I'm like, dude, we're having this huge fight. Everybody's super upset. How did these ADK sneak into this? It's like, well, yeah, I talked to a bunch of other people. And everybody told me the price is way too low. And then they're all telling me, because you know we had an agreement to pay over a long period of time yeah. and not do a one-time cash payment, yeah. that you know I'm going to have all these extra costs and this guy and that and the other. And I'm like, man, like you should have known this before we agreed to the deal. Yeah. Terms because this, because these are diff this is a different number. Yeah. And my co-founder was really upset. And so we went back and forth and he was negotiating hard for this. And then he went down from 80 to 50 to, and eventually he was just like, just give me 10K more, something. Yeah, like I he just needs need to get to, something. Yeah, he needs to get something. And then I felt like if I push him a little, my co-founders co were like, no, <laughs> like not a dollar more than what we agreed on. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? I feel like we're getting to the point where I push him so much that he- You gotta give something. You gotta give some, But we'll do it in a different way because you guys are really upset. So I pinged him and I go, all right, listen, I had a huge fight with my co-founders. They're really upset. They really don't wanna do this. I kinda see your way. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pay you 5K out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. 5K, we're not gonna tell anybody. This nope. is a separate thing. You and I. The original deal stays intact and then you got some money to pay for whatever yeah. imaginary expenses that he came up with. Yeah. And then he was like, all ah, right, no, I don't wanna take your money. Just when you're in the area, like take let's have lunch, take something. me out for wow. dinner or lunch and like whatever, let's just close the deal. Um, but uh, yeah, we wanted, we wanted the domain to- uh, Dude, it just sets the stand. Like, I mean, you, do, you reach out, it's closed.com, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different. And I was surprised when we announced the, that we purchased the .com, um, a ton of people reached out and congratulated me to things that I never announced, right? So, so people were like, like amazing. Funding? Yeah, funding oh, round sure. and acquisition. I see that. Funding round and acquisition all day long. People were like, oh my God, congrats to the acquisition. Like, what, which acquisition? Well, you, didn't you sell the company? I'm like, no. no. There was no word about acquisition. No word about funding, but people just assumed. They filled in the blanks. Something big happened. They bought a very expensive domain. Yeah. They filled in the blanks. Uh, so it was interesting to see kind of the perception in the marketplace. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, on that note, you, um, you know, we see each other a lot at events. So, you know, you're out there speaking, building your brand. How have you, you know, a lot of founders that get the opportunity, they're always, there's kind of two, I, I, I meet maybe like two distinct founders, people in the gray zone in the middle, but there's ones that are like heads down, like why, you know, they're just like, don't go out of your office, yeah. say no to everything, focus on yeah. the product. And then there's folks like, you know, yourself, myself, and many others that realize our customers are there. And if we get the opportunity, essentially it's a group presentation sometimes, right? Yeah. If we do it yeah. right. How do you balance the travel speaking and leading the, you know, a successful SaaS product? Yeah. Um, I'm still figuring it out and I'm adjusting. Like last year I did too many, too many talks. So this year I scaled down significantly, yeah. but w there's a couple of things that need to be considered. I think um, people are not strategic about these things. So first, it's easy for me to speak. It's something that comes naturally to me. It's something that needs almost no preparation. I don't spend two, three weeks preparing a keynote. I don't. If I had to do that, I would not be speaking yeah. as much. right? So I have certain talents and abilities that allow me to do certain things really, really well. And we see results, hence why we choose to do these things. Mm -hmm. So for me, speaking comes very naturally. Yeah, you're not stressed. You're not not sleeping the night before. I'm not not sleeping the night before. Yeah. I'm not even spending hours and hours on the deck. On the deck. Or, yeah. I'm not. So it's natural, it's easy, it's simple. Then I try to only go to events where, where I can answer the question, will there be some potential future customers? Are there some current customers there? And could there be some people there that we wanna hire and work with? Yeah. If the answer is yes to all three, then I'll consider the event. Mm -hmm. I've been invited to lots and lots of cool sounding events and I'm yeah. like, wait a second, I'm gonna go and speak at Adidas or Nike or some, how is that gonna help my, like there's no buyers, there, there's no. no future employees there, there's nobody there that could help my business. So it might be fun, yeah. but I can't really justify yeah, it. Yeah, you don't need a paid vacation right now. Yes, yeah. I, a flight in a hotel room is not that exciting I know people are like, hey man, come to Singapore, we'll <laughs> yeah, cover all yeah, your yeah, expenses, yeah. and you come with your wife. I'm like, I don't need you to pay no. for my vacation, no. man. Yeah, I, and I, I like on my vacation, I'd like to vacation. Vacation, <laughs> yes. I mean, that's the other thing. Yes, I don't want to work for you. Um, 
So, so you've gotten better last year, too many this year, a little bit higher filter. Yes. So and then, and then I always try to like, I try to squeeze as much out of these events as possible. So, um, I will go to an event and I'll ask myself, can we do a customer meetup? Mm. Uh, are there certain customers that are going to be there that I want, I want to meet anyway, so yeah. I can just combine that. Um, is there somebody that I've tried to hire? Um, this is, you know, at a time like this now where there's somebody I've been trying to hire for a long time. If that person is around, that increases the likelihood that I want to say yes. I'm like, okay, I'm yeah. going to go and then I'm going to have some dinner time, lunch time, coffee. Do you coffee. look at the speaker list to see if there's anybody that you want to connect with from an industry point of view? You know, that's never a factor that makes me say yes, yeah. but it Two is competing a factor. Options. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 is a, it can be a filter. And it's a signal to the quality of the event potential. Yes. Yeah. Like if I see that there are a lot of amazing speakers, I'm like, all right, all these people are, you know, they are typically thoughtful with their time. If yeah. they say yes and I don't know the event, yeah. it will sway me. It will yeah. influence me. Yeah. Um, and so I try to like combine things. And then I, I also try to, to just batch things together. So the last three weeks are a great example where um, I will do, I, it's to the outside world, it seems like I travel and speak a lot okay, more than I do. You just compress it in that yes, three weeks. Yes. So I'll, I won't travel for three months and then I'll travel an insane amount for two weeks and do like a, a bunch of events, workshops, this, that, and the other, and then I'm off again, not traveling for two months. But to the outside world through social media, it seems like I never ever stop, stop traveling, but it's not as Is much. Is that the cadence that you like, kind of a two week, two month? <sighs> so I used to do, when I was doing Clarity, I used to do one week, seven weeks. It's interesting. I haven't answered that question to myself. I don't even know. Yeah. I think now, without really thinking about it too deeply, I do, uh, I do think I get, you know, after two or three months, I'm ready to like go and be with the people. Yeah. Right. Be with the because <laughs> be with the people, because when I don't travel, <laughs> where are my people? I, I am people are always surprised people that know me really well. Uh, they, they know this, but new people that meet me and get to know me better. They're always surprised that when at home, I'm actually not that social. Yeah. I spend time with my kids, wife, and I don't go to events, I don't go to meetups, I don't do dinners, don't do lunches. I meet very few people, right? I'm just really a, a yeah, just work, Your thing. family, yeah. and then I just want to have to, like, I either want to be alone or I want to be in front of 10,000 people. Yeah. That, those are the two spaces two I'm streams, comfortable. Yeah. So after two or three months, I'm like, I'm ready to go out there. Um, but I think, think a maximum of like a week is always nice. Like a week of travel is great. Mm. Uh, two weeks is usually like, okay, towards the end of the two weeks, I'm like, this was good, but now I'm ready and three weeks is too long. Got it. Um, three weeks is what I'm doing now. now I'm telling you ready. the next couple of days, I'm going to be like, yeah. I'm going to really have to control my inner voice that's complaining all day yeah. long that it's too much. As you look back over the, you know, since starting close, you know, I know my journey, if I look back even a decade to who I, who I needed to become to be the person today, when you look at your journey, who, what are the things or who did you need to become? To lead this company. Yeah, I think the biggest transformation that I went through uh, was becoming consistent. That was something that was completely lacking. Discipline and consistency was completely lacking in my life up until close, really, like a, a year before close or, or so. Um, because I always I had this thing where I would have these amazing weeks where I would just pull things out of a hat and make magic happen, do things I would, su I would surprise myself and mm. delight myself. How did I do this? How did I come up with this? Like, and I, I create like all this value and I create impressive moments. But then it, they would inevitably follow phases of like, I don't know even how to call it, but it would be just like a week or two of not getting anything done. And I would have these, I'm very grumpy in the morning. I'm not a morning person. And so I would take that morning grumpiness and allow it to influence me into canceling my first meeting or call. And then that would spiral out of control into canceling all my meetings and calls for a day. And then I would feel so terrible about that day that I would cancel everything the next, next day. day yeah. I would these terrible, Downward terrible spiral, yeah. phases of like just being to totally unreliable. And, ups and, downs. and, I, and I, I went to a million workshops. I read all the books. I was like, how do I unbreak my brain? And I think my desire was to like, how can I not feel this way? Like, how can I just always be in a great state, in a state where I can make magic happen, a state where I control, that I have confidence, that I can get things done, that I'm productive. Why am I so up and down in my emotional states? How can I like get rid of that? And I, ne I was never able to like fully take control over it. Um, and then one day I heard this quote, I don't know why or what led up to l hearing that quote in such a different way that moment, because I heard it before. But I heard the quote of like, 
The difference between the hero and the coward is not that the hero isn't afraid and the coward is, it's that the hero, she acts despite her fear versus the coward is held back by it. And I heard that and something clicked in me and I went, wait a second, I don't have to feel like doing the call or taking the meeting. I can do things while not despite. feeling like them. I can f do it despite feeling whatever the way I feel. And then I developed this internal mantra where any time I was like, oh, I really don't want to do this, I would go like, oh. Despite. Just do it anyways. Who cares? Well, but I'm going to do a really bad job and I'm going to feel terrible. Do it feeling terrible. Do it feeling terrible. And I start doing things feeling terrible and then I felt great because I did them. And my emotions were not running my life. I was running my emotions. And these bad moments in the morning were turned into my best days. And that really, that thing, that switch transformed my life completely. And it's the, the only reason why I'm able to run the business I run today and have the impact I have today, something I was never able to do before. I did well. To the outside world, still people th felt I did well, but I was so in an in inner war turmoil. with myself and yeah. turmoil because I could never look in the mirror and be like, I'm doing my best. Yeah. I would always look in the mirror and go, I knew I'm Ups not doing my best. And I can't keep the word to myself or to others. Mm. It's, I'm going to have to feel like keeping my word. And that switch changed everything. Just literally everything I was able to do since that changed in my life uh, was day and night. So that kind of was the most impactful change I had to go through to be able to run close. That's huge, man. Uh, where do people find you online? What's the best channel that you like to communicate? Yeah, so people can always reach out to me directly, Steli at close.com, um, at Steli on Twitter. Instagram. Uh, Instagram, Steli FD, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, if you like podcasts and you haven't listened to the Startup Chat, Startup go to Chat. the startupchat.com. You can find the feed there and subscribe to it and listen uh, to me twice a week. Dude, I um, just want to let you know how much I appreciate the fact that you've shared so much over the years, everything you've learned, not only with Heaton, but even with the YouTube videos. I mean, you've taught a lot of non-sales oriented founders to sell in a way that's not schemey. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a rarity, you know, even though we see a lot of these creators, the fact that you've been doing it so long and consistently is a huge, uh, it's incredible. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Appreciate you, man. My man. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.